temptations on every hand Though Satan's tried to stop me And to place my feet on sinking sand Through the pain and all of my sorrows Through the tears and all Keep me for he's kept me in the midst of it all. Jeremiah chapter 29, we are continuing um, a, a, a series that we began earlier this year entitled The Goshen Project. And simply, it's about God's plan to put his people in uh, predetermined places for the purpose of their growth and their development. And even though it may look like a dark place, you have not been buried, you've been planted. So now you must change your mind about yourself. Stop looking at yourself as a corpse. And start looking at yourself as a seed. Because in you, Surat, there is this embryo this God in embryo that is waiting to be birthed, to come forth and to impact wherever God places you. And so we've talked about this Goshen piece where God takes the people, takes Israel in the days of Joseph, puts them in a place that nobody wants to be, puts them in a position that is detestable, and out of that comes a great nation, a great group of people. Sometimes God, sometimes the devil has you right where God wants you. Sometimes he will allow the devil to have his hands on you for the purpose of positioning you in a place where God can use you and get the glory and glory out of your life. So I want to read, because we've been in Jeremiah 29 for the past three weeks. And I just want to continue the reading and the explanation of the text. We're going to read Jeremiah 29. And we're going to read a few verses, starting at verse 15. We'll conclude at verse 19. Then I want to call your attention very quickly to Hebrews. Chapter number 12, beginning at verse 6, ending at verse 11. Jeremiah 29, 15. I'm reading from the New International Version. You may say the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. But this is what the Lord says about the king who sits on David's throne and all the people who remain in the city, your fellow citizens who did not go with you into exile. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will send the sword, famine and plague against them and I will make them like figs that are so bad that cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with the sword, famine and plague, and will make them abhorrent to all kingdoms of the earth, a curse and an object of horror, of scorn and reproach among all the nations where I drive them. For they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord. Words that I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. And you exiles have not listened either, declares the Lord. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6. Hebrews 12, verse number 6. Hebrews 12, verse 6. You have it. Say amen. amen. Hebrews 12, verse number 6 says, Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. 
For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have had all kinds of human fathers who disciplined us and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? For the sake of time, I want to drop down to verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Somebody say amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say protected by chaos. Protected by chaos. Turn to somebody else and say protected by chaos. Protected by chaos. Touch yourself and say self. Self. This crazy season I'm in. This crazy season I'm in. Is God's way of protecting me. If you believe it, put those hands together and give God a hand of praise. Y'all were a bit reticent and a bit tentative in your praise. But I promise you by the end of the message, you'll get what the Lord is trying to say to you. Protected by chaos. Good morning, family. My brothers and my sisters, September, in particular September the 10th, 1990, legendary music producer Quincy Jones stepped into what was then uncharted waters for him. And he produced a sitcom for television entitled The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The show starred Will Smith as a fictionalized version of himself, a street-wise teenager from West Philadelphia who is sent to move in with his wealthy uncle and aunt in their Bel-Air mansion. He sent there because he got into a fight with some young men in his hometown. Because the environment in Uncle Phil and Aunt Viv's home was one of strict discipline, and because the culture in the gated community in Bel Air was drastically different from the streets in the hood in West Philly, Will's lifestyle often clashed with the lifestyle of his relatives in Bel Air. He felt trapped and imprisoned. And Mo, at times, he even felt like a fish out of water. In one particular episode, Will's mother comes out to visit and they get into a heated confrontation because Will states that he feels unloved and unwanted because his mother sent him away to live in Bel Air. She explains to him and Bride that she sent him away not because she did not love him, but on the contrary, she sent him away because she did love him. Will's mother saw the potential for him to have a bright future. And she knew that if she had allowed him to become comfortable in the street life of West Philly, his life would have more than likely been cut short like so many other young black men in his age group. Yeah. Though Bel Air was foreign, it was a foreign, chaotic, and uncomfortable environment for young Will. His mother's decision to send him there was actually protecting him from ultimate destruction and preserving him for his ultimate destiny. Are you listening? It is hard for us to fathom that the emotional pain that is produced by seasons of crazy chaos, divine discipline, and hellish hardship is God's way of perfecting us, preserving us, and protecting us. Hence, I call your attention to the subtext that we use for this morning's message. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 11. I will not read it all again, but I'll give you a synoptic overview of it. It says that the Lord literally gives us insight to the very phenomenon of chastening of 
the Lord that perfects, preserves, and protects us for our future. In verse number six, here's what he says. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And whom he embraces, he corrects. And in verse number 11, Mama Judy, he gives it all up. He sums it up with this statement. Though it does not feel good when it's happening, the end result is spiritual maturity and right relationship with God. In other words, when God chases you, when God disciplines you, when God assigns you to a season of chaos, even when you can't understand what's happening, and even when you don't know the whys and all of the what's, God's plan is to bring you through it, and you will come through it. And he's going to bring you through it as a better version of yourself. Somebody ought to shout yes. Because God sees the future, and we don't. We stand, Mother Adams, in the present, and all we can do is look back at the past and identify places and points in our lives where we have experienced similar hardships. And the enemy would have us to think that because we're going through hardships, because we're experiencing difficulties, it means that God is punishing us. But God is not in the business of punishing anybody who will willfully submit themselves to him. Sometimes it will take time. But God knows that if he keeps working with you, that you will see that whatever you're experiencing is not punishment, but it is perfection. Now God sees your future, and he is protecting you. He's protecting you and keeping you by not allowing you to advance into some things that you thought you wanted to advance into. I know I got a few people in here who have the testimony that you're glad that God didn't give you what you wanted then. For you've seen what the end result would be now. He was fine in high school, but now he ain't nothing like that. She was fine in college, but now she ain't nothing like that. Huh, because God sees into the future and protects you from, from things that you think you want now. I'm thinking about a story now. My cousin Olivet and I, uh, in, when we were in high school, uh, we'd gotten really close and we had planned to go out on Halloween night. And uh, I had just presumed that I would be able to make the plan, Charlize, and we'd be able to hang. It was on one of those nights that one of those Halloween installments, I think it was Halloween 2, I'm telling y'all how old I am in case you guessed it. Halloween 2 was how that we had made plans to go to the movies. I walked up to my dad and I asked my dad when we came uh, into the house after school, Daddy, uh, I'd like the key so Olivet and I could go out. Daddy said to me, son, no, you can't go. I'm trying to figure out why I can't go because I made my bed, I had washed the dishes, I was making good grades, and trying to figure out why I would not be allowed to go to this movie. My dad simply looked at me and said to me, son, you can't go because there's too much uh -uh going on. He stopped it right there. And I couldn't figure it out, so I pouted, I went to my room. All of that and I were not only going to the movie, the movie started at seven, we would get out at nine something, and then we would go to the house of a man who managed my band by the name of Joe. Joe was throwing a party for his nephew, Butch. Oh God, Butch snapped on that night, bought a gun in and shot up the entire house, killed his uncle and killed a few other people. If my daddy had allowed me to go to the movies and I had left the movies and then went to the party, I could have been up casually. I wish I had somebody in here to know that God knows your future and he sees you down the road before you can. And I'm so glad that I didn't get to go in the midst of the open because the open might have been something that I could not have recovered in. Is there anybody besides you?
next level of tension, Mary Tao, between God and the Hebrews who are in exile in Babylon. I call it the next level of tension because not only has Jeremiah informed them that they will stay in their chaotic situation much longer than they anticipated or wanted to, because you remember they had received a prophecy from a false prophet who said, y'all won't be out in 70 years. Jeremiah comes back and said, no, not seven, 70. Y'all won't be here for a while, so you may as well make the best out of that situation. That's tension on one level. But here is the next level of tension. The next level of tension is this, that not only would they stay there longer than they wanted to, but there was also a group of Israelites that God left in Jerusalem, watch this, who were guilty of the same apostasy that they were at evil. You God, watch this, because you got your mind, because he took you out of a situation that almost made you lose your mind. Can I talk to somebody in here who has a testimony? I'm glad my circle got smaller because everybody in my circle was not in my corner. Now the more they fell off, the more I began to see that anything that I ain't got, I don't need for my future. Somebody lift your hand, open your mouth and shout, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. By the chaos that he allowed you to be in. There three things I got to share. I got two minutes and 17 seconds. I got, I, I got a walk wall, mama. Drop it like it's hot. Three, three things I need to tell you. First thing you need to know about God protecting you uh, by chaos is that while God has you in a season, chaos. Things are getting crazy. And while you're there, God is uprooting and pulling down principalities that will have a negative impact on your future. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Cobra, that while God has you detained in a season of chaos, confusion and discipline and hardship. He is busy uprooting and pulling down principalities or ruling powers or spirits that have been assigned to your life to keep you from progressing forward in destiny. I ain't making it up. It's in verse number 16. Notice what he says. He says, y'all are running around here talking about uh, you have given us prophets in Babylon because what you want to hear is you want to hear what you want to hear, but you don't hear what I want to tell you. And I've already told you that I've got a plan for your life. And it's a talk of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope, but you don't understand it right now. So i got to bring you back to the forefront and help you to understand that your desire to hear something that tickles your ears is the reason that you are in this chaos. Because I can't put you in chaos unless I got a reason to do it. But I knew what you would do and how you would think before you started doing it and started thinking it. So I'm working this whole thing together for your good. And he's saying, now here's what you need to understand. I got to get out of here, Pam. He says in verse number 16, I love it, y'all. He says, now here's what you need to know. You, you wanted it easy. You, you wanted it your way. But I'm working on the other side. He says, this is what the Lord says about the king who sits on David's throne and all the people who remain in the city, your fellow citizens who did not go with you into exile. Is what he's saying. He's saying that there was a king or a ruling power, and there were people who were connected to that ruling power that were in your space. That if I had allowed you to stay connected to them, you would have been pulled further down with them. He said, So I had to move you out of the situation so I could begin to deal with them. Some of you are crying about who has left your life. Some of you are even crying about who treated you in a particular way. But God said that they were on a demonic assignment to keep you from moving into the place that I purpose for you to move into. And had I allowed you to stay connected to them, you would have stayed right where you are. So I had to pull you out of it so that I could deal with whatever it was. You were not strong enough to deal with on your 
sick at their very presence and their very sight. He said, so I had to move you <laughs> so that you would not be collateral damage. Because when I said what I said, it's going to wreak havoc wherever I send it. Come here, help me to preach it for a minute, Moses. God told you, I'm getting ready to deliver Israel. Watch this. Bring them out of Egypt right now. But I need you to take a leg of one year old and tell every house of, head of the household to kill the leg. Take the blood and put it on the lintel and the doorposts. Because I'm about to send the death angel through. And the only reason I ain't gonna kill everything that's there is because I'll see the blood. I'm going to pass Oh, I feel like preaching in here So here's what God says I had to bring you out To cover you Because if you stayed in that situation You were going to become Collateral damage You know what collateral damage is, don't you? It wasn't intended for you But just because You were there You got hit A couple of weeks ago, I found myself in a situation where somebody dishonored and disrespected my baby girl, Shanae. I found that I did, I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. My whole family was there, and my whole family was being disrespected. But when the fella said something to Chanel, Nick jumped up out of his seat, squared up with the fellow and got his face. Chanel was standing back in the corner. Chanel started popping off. I looked Nick square in the eye and said, Nick, shut up and sit down. I turned around to Chanel. I said, Chanel, be quiet and don't say another word. And I stepped up in the fellow's face.
Now watch this. Watch your brother Mike. Watch your brother Drew. Y'all, y'all please. Watch your brother Reed. Come on, watch this. I gotta get out of here. Oh, gee. I'm telling you, watch this. I gotta preach to the mothers because God told me to tell y'all. For whatever I'm preaching to the mothers, now I'm preaching to all the elders. For whatever you've been through in these past seasons, and for whatever you've been through it for, God said, I'm getting ready to turn everything around for you. Y'all missed it. I think the mothers ought to be shouting. I think somebody ought to be getting my glory. God said, I'm going to turn it and use it for your good. I'm going to still answer your prayers. you just earned 
learn. But watch this, God was disciplining you. Because he said, I got something better in store for your present action. And he said, I got to bring you in. I got to reel you back so that when you wake up in your new day, you will realize that you're not here and you did not survive because you were slick. Thank <laughs> you.
out of chaos. God knows what it takes to do two things. He knows what it takes to make you keep your eye on him. And put your eye back on him. And he knows what it takes to make you take your hands off.
the judgment that they're under will fall on you. Because it wasn't until Job prayed for his friends that God turned his head to Some of them are dealing with some real serious diseases and you ain't even aware of it. God says, when you find out, matter of fact, he's going to give some of y'all insight. He says, and when I give you insight, just start praying. God's getting ready to start putting people in your heart to pray for them. It's going to be, be people that don't like you, and quite honestly, you don't like what God said. I need you to start walking in love and pray and to see Jesus. Spirit of worship. Please lift your hands. We gotta go.